Hello, everyone. Today, our discussion will be about an innovative technique and effective procedure in treating conditions affecting the thyroid, parathyroid, and the adrenal glands, the transoral endocrine surgery. Let us welcome Dr. Riemann Grogan, Associate Professor of Surgery at Baylor Stanford Medical Center. Dr. Riemann is a board certified surgeon specializing in endocrine surgery. Uh, in addition to his expertise in the traditional surgical approaches, Dr. Grogan is a pioneer of new techniques and he's uh, one of only few experts on transoral endocrine surgery, a novel approach that leaves no uh, visible scar on the neck. Hello, doctor. We are glad to have you with us today. Yes, good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. So doctor, uh, please tell us uh, first, what is the transoral endocrine surgery? So transoral endocrine surgery uh, is a set of operations that have been introduced to allow us to take organs out of the neck with no visible scar on the front of the neck. Um, in particular, we're talking mostly about thyroids and parathyroids. Yeah. Um, in the traditional sense, we used to make an incision across the front that was quite visible. Um, and now with the invention of this new type of procedure, we're able to remove thyroid and parathyroid organs without any visible scar. Mm -hmm. And uh, how is it performed? Uh, how, how, how is it performed? Which way? It's, it's essentially a laparoscopic or endoscopic procedure. So we use um, instruments that are about the diameter of a pen, roughly. Um, and we make incisions on the inside of the lower lip, three of them typically, and pass the instruments between the skin and the jaw here um, to allow us access to the thyroid and the parathyroid in the neck. Um, and by doing that, again, the incisions are hidden on the inside of the lower lip. So essentially, it's a laparoscopic surgery um, that uh, um, just has the advantage of leaving no visible scar on the person. Okay. And uh, doctor, who is uh, eligible for such a surgery? Is everyone uh, eligible for such or, or uh, some patients uh, uh, don't have the benefit of uh, this uh, kind of surgery? Yes, so in general, anyone who needs surgery for the thyroid and parathyroid are eligible with some exceptions. Um, and what I mean to say by that is we can operate on any type of pathology that a thyroid or parathyroid may need surgery for. The main limitations are based on the size of the thyroid. Um, so anything that's too large uh, that can't be passed through the incision here is really not eligible. Mm. Um, uh, we can operate on cancers this way as well, but there are size limitations to that also. Um, and for parathyroids, um, the majority of people who have parathyroid needs can be operated on with this technique. Um, we did some studies and found that about 60 to 70 percent of all people who need thyroid or parathyroid surgery would be eligible for this type of procedure. Mm -hmm. oh, great. So to, to what extent is this technique safe? For, uh, for a patient, comparing to the traditional one? So complication rates are extremely comparable to the traditional approach. Um, in general, for thyroid or parathyroid surgery, complication rates are around two to 3%. Um, as long as you have a surgeon who has a lot of experience and is doing high volumes of thyroid surgery. Um, so the complication rates for the traditional incision are basically the same as they are for the transoral scarless approach. Um, complications that are common or possible with thyroid and parathyroid surgery are injury to a nerve that controls your vocal cord. Yeah. Um, that happens in about 1% of cases. Uh, injury to the parathyroid glands happen about 1% of cases. Um, bleeding and infection are common to all types of surgeries are possible, but pretty rare. Um, and again, those complication rates are comparable between the traditional and the transoral approach. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the only benefit uh, is uh, is uh, not leaving a visible uh, scar, or uh, is there any other benefits uh, for this surgery? As of right now, there's there's no proven benefit in the literature other than the fact that there is no visible scar across the front of the neck, which is uh, the most important, I think, because I. 
the patient, uh, the first thing that a patient uh, is scared about or fear is the, the scar that would be uh, around uh, his neck. I, I agree. Um, I think it is an important uh, benefit uh, that sometimes gets overlooked, but uh, these scars, even if they heal well, which most of the time they do, they are quite visible because of their location. Um, it's not like a scar, you know, on your back or on your abdomen where the vast majority of times it's covered up and hidden. A scar on the neck is always open and visible um, to both other people as well as the patient themselves. Um, and for example, in terms of a cancer patient, uh, this scar is a daily reminder that they have mm -hmm. cancer. Um, and why have that if you don't really need it, if we're able to provide a um, another way of doing this with no scar that's just as safe as the traditional approach? And uh, we know that uh, mostly women are affected by uh, more than men, I think. So women are, are very skeptical with the scars and... Uh, isn't that, that is true? true. <laughs> that is true. So yeah. with both thyroid and parathyroid um, problems, it's about three to one female to male predominance. So um, it's three times more common in women as opposed to men. Um, the average age of diagnosis for a lot of these surgical issues is around the age of 45 to 55. So um, what I guess we would consider middle age at this point, but we also diagnose this in younger age groups as well. Um, we've done studies that have shown that no matter the age of the patient, the scar is a concern or a question. Um, and, um, you know, people do prefer to not have a scar if they have that option. Of course. So, doctor, we know that the surgeon uh, role is very crucial in this uh, practice. So, can you tell us who can per perform this technique and... Um, what sort of training a surgeon should have before performing this kind of uh, operation? Yes, so um, in general with surgery, uh, volume is indicative of outcomes. Um, so in other words, the more volume a person is doing or a surgeon is doing, typically the better their outcomes are going to be. Um, and uh, this is across the board with almost all types of surgeries. It's kind of intuitive, but there are data that back that up. So really, you want to find a surgeon who is doing a high volume, number one, of thyroid or parathyroid surgery in general, whether that's traditional or scarless approach. That should be between a minimum of 50 to 75 cases per year. For the transoral approach, um, there's additional training that's required to learn it. Um, most people will go to a course um, where it's being taught by um, people with a lot of high volume experience like myself and others around the world. Um, that course usually includes a cadaver course where, you know, proctors are there to teach the surgeon how to do that procedure. Then essentially what will happen is the surgeon will come back to their own institution and be proctored through a few cases with a, another surgeon um, kind of watching them and helping them. Yeah. Um, once they do that, then uh, they go on and start doing the procedure on their own. Um, but typically it requires that someone be a high volume thyroid surgeon to start with. Um, the background training, whether it's general surgery or head and neck surgery, doesn't matter as much as the volume of surgery that they're doing um, in their practice. Mm -hmm. So uh, now at uh, Baylor St. Luke, uh, what is the percentage uh, of using this uh, technique, new technique, comparing to the traditional one? In our practice, around 30%, 30 to 35% of people are getting the scarless transoral approach. Yeah. Um, for both thyroid and parathyroid problems. Mm -hmm. So, uh, doctor, what other uh, minimal invasive uh, uh, techniques you are using in um, for thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenal surgery uh, in general uh, at Baylor St. Luke? Do you have other uh, uh, techniques you are using now? We do. So, you know, with parathyroid surgery in particular, um, if they're not eligible for the completely scarless approach, we use what in the past has been called minimally invasive um, parathyroid surgery, where we use very small incisions. Um, sometimes we can do a parathyroid surgery with an incision as small as two centimeters in size, which is quite small. Um, and the same goes for thyroid surgery. We don't do two centimeter incisions, but we do relatively small incisions for thyroid surgery if they're not eligible for the transoral approach. Um, and with adrenal surgery, 
pretty nearly 99% of all adrenal surgery is now done through minimally invasive approaches being laparoscopic surgery, essentially, where we use three or four very small one centimeter incisions in the abdomen or on the back um, to remove the adrenal gland that way. So those are all considered minimally invasive procedures at this point, with some rare exceptions. Mm -hmm. And doctor, uh, how common is it used? Uh, do, you, do you have an idea how common is it used outside the, the United States? Uh, is there any uh, special uh, instruments uh, to be used uh, that are uh, not available outside the, the United States? Uh, so this is uh, probably actually more common in some other countries outside of the United States than it is currently in the U.S. Um, it, the instruments are not necessarily anything special. Um, they're the same instruments we use for all laparoscopic surgeries, let's say a laparoscopic gallbladder surgery. Um, or laparoscopic colon surgery. So anywhere where laparoscopic surgery is done, the instruments are available. The main issue surrounding its widespread adoption has been around training. Um, the procedure is actually more common in um, Asian countries such as uh, Thailand, Korea, um, are two of the uh, leaders um, worldwide for this, I would say. Um, the, It, in its current form, it was pretty much invented in Thailand, um, or it was perfected, I could say, in Thailand by a single surgeon there. Um, and uh, they have really led the way for the rest of the world. Um, in the United States, due to um, just the slow training process, um, there, it's being done here, um, but not by very many surgeons currently. Would you like to add anything else, doctor, uh, concerning this uh, this procedure or technique so people uh, uh, could know about? Um, I pretty much would just say that, you know, this is a really good technique. It is a viable approach to the thyroid and parathyroid. It is safe. Um, and the scar uh, can be um, more impactful than some people might give credit for it. So I do think it's an important operation. I do think currently it's hard to find a surgeon who can do these surgeries. Um, we are one of the few centers in the United States and for that matter in the world that does it. Um, but if you're able to find a surgeon in your area that can do it, I think it's fantastic. Um, obviously we operate on people from all over the world. Uh, so we are um, adept at taking care of international patients as well. We're happy to take care of anyone from anywhere in the world. And doctor, did you see a, a difference in psychological reaction after the surgery with people who did this new technique uh, uh, comparing to the traditional one? We do. So there are some data on that. Um, there were some interesting studies done recently um, looking at eye tracking movement, for example. Um, and when a person meets another person, the um, first place that they typically tend to look is in a triangle between the two eyes and the mouth. Um, that's a well-known mm -hmm. triangle that is the focus of attention when you first meet a new person. And uh, we have some pretty interesting data showing that if you have a scar down here, when a, someone first meets a person with a scar here, rather than focusing on that triangle, they actually focus on the scar. Yeah. So it can, in fact, change interaction um, in a probably a Psychically, in a um, subconscious manner, um, almost when you first interact with another um, person. Um, we also know, based on data, that the scar is something that people worry about um, and something that does impact quality of life. Again, maybe on even a subconscious level, but it is identifiable and it is measurable um, scientifically. And we see that in the scientific literature. So um, we certainly do have some data out there that supports that idea. Okay, doctor, thank you very much for your time and your information. And um, hopefully we'll have uh, more uh, new techniques in the future that can help people uh, get better uh, in, all, in all the way possible. Yes, of course. Thanks for having me. I um, really appreciate the time to talk about this. And um, thank you very much. Thank you.